The Simon Filer Podcast, giving authors a platform. Welcome. Welcome to the podcast. Mark Berridge is one of the most inspirational people I've met in my life, and his story, A Fraction Stronger, is absolutely incredible. Uh, a journey from an horrific bicycle accident and through the inspirations that gave him hope to recover and become stronger, fraction by fraction, literally. Welcome to my podcast, Mark. Oh, absolute treat to be on it, Simon. Mm, I'm loving it as well. I feel incredibly privileged that you've chosen to work with me, bringing your audio to life um, in audiobook format. Thank you. How did you find narrating your story here? Yeah, well, it was a lot better when I brought the reading glasses. So I think that's a <laughs> trap for uh, young players. Um, yes, I'm still in denial about that needing the glasses. They sort of only came along post-accident and uh, I'm just working through that. So if you do have a listen, you find the first few pages a bit dodgy. It's not someone's fault, it's mine. <laughs> That's not true at all. He's done a superb job. Glasses on. We could even big in that font. <laughs> we did. We had had to expand the font, and uh, yeah, the 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 production room is a little bit dark, so that's my excuse. And I'm I'm I'm, I'm gr- holding on to that one with my fingernails. That 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 excuse. <laughs> you did an amazing job. There was so much emotion in your in your story, and I think you nailed it. So don't stress about it. All right. Yeah, there was definitely a few moments where the uh, though I didn't. There was no tears as I recorded, but I definitely could feel a little chokes in my throat at different stages and. You know, it's a very personal story and, um, you know, I was blessed by so much kindness that helped me navigate what was really tough. And and so you reflect on that as you're reading it. And uh, yeah, and some some of the moments are a little bit uncomfortable for remembering as well. And uh, yeah, so but it's a real pleasure to be able to record it and share it. And it, it took me a while, but I'm really glad I did it. Yeah, awesome. Well, I've learned so many things in our 14 hour journey. Humility is probably the biggest lesson how lucky I am to be here living this life, Um, but also not taking things for granted, which we can all say, we all say, you know, don't take it for granted. But in reality, do we really understand what that means, taking things for granted, you know? Maybe you can shed, shed some light on this because obviously before your accident, everything was okay. Did you ever consider that your life might just change in an instant? No, I've, I mean, you know, my, my wife had been through a pretty tough journey with bowel cancer. So, you know, with um, that and some other um, experiences around us, I mean, you, you know, it can always happen. But of course, you never quite expect it to to impact you as suddenly and as abruptly as a spinal cord injury. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I don't think you, you know, you ever do. And even when it does, of course, you I'm going to say most of us maybe it's just me but I, I think there's surely the blankets a bit wider you know you sort of feel like oh maybe i'm a bit superhuman and i'll find a way to come back from it better so i think all of those things stop us from really fully appreciating how badly we could be impacted by a moment you know both mm-hmm. that feeling of it's unlikely and you know i'll find a way to navigate it better than others um so yeah i would say i guess those things and come back to the humility i, I guess i'd i'd like to think i was good at practicing that prior to the injury but obviously i wouldn't have always been you know we all have our moments um but in a way it was a coping mechanism you know through the injury and the recovery was Mm -hmm. just to keep reflecting on all the goodness around me and how that was helping me and how by appreciating what i did have um it made me focus less on what i didn't have anymore Mm. yeah tell me life about um mark and your family before the accident so had a pretty amazing life overall. Um, three absolutely beautiful children, all born here in Brisbane. Um, we spent a few years living up in Singapore for a um, pretty intense job um, that both my wife and I had up in there uh, for a while. So it was a beautiful life experience for us all. I'd grown up in Western Australia and moved from Western Australia to Hong Kong for a few years before, before coming to Brisbane. So. Yeah, pretty, um, I guess, blessed life really from an opportunity perspective um, and from beautiful uh, wife and and children and just life was good. It was really busy. We were probably only just really holding it together. And I think a lot of families are like that, aren't they? When you've got a lot of, you know, three kids and sporting events and school and, you know, at the time of the accident, my oldest was in year 12, second was in year 11. and. yeah, so you know, pretty you know, pretty major disruption to and our it, lives. So. It was before COVID too, wasn't it? Your accident. Yeah, I always again, you know, take back to that gratitude. I feel that was really um, fortunate, and you know, obviously, I always whenever I say that fortunate, I, I sort of half check myself because, of course, you know, 
it's a perspective thing, whether we're fortunate or not, and people find their way through even tougher times. So when I say, you know, I feel I was really lucky it was before COVID, well, there's people that probably got through what I got through but did it during COVID, you know. Yeah. So people can, I think people do find a way to cope regardless, but I do think it was very fortunate it was before COVID because of the ability for people to come and visit me in hospital and provide really, really important support um, and belief and you know, just share their stories of how they might have got through something similar and that helped. Uh, or the ability to keep going back and back to the gym because that was just, again, another one of my coping mm. mechanisms was how do I just take some action? I don't care. Mm. You know, There's no point sitting here and lamenting what I can't do. Yeah. The only way out of this is to drive forward on what I can do. So, yeah, yeah I feel very fortunate it was you know, pre-COVID. Yeah. yeah. Your biking accident, you that morning you weren't actually, you weren't going to go on a ride, but you got up early and you thought, you know, let's do this. I was a bit, um, I was a bit on the edge because I'd had a really, really busy work week. I was preparing for this workshop. I was going to be away from home for two weeks, delivering the workshop and doing follow-up work. It was in Salt Lake City in America. So I was scheduled to fly, I think 9.30 that night. And yeah, because I felt tired, I sort of almost didn't. And I thought, no, it's really going to be, you know, it does really help me sleep on the plane. It's good for me to go. I want to see the boys one last time before I go. And we actually had two of our riding group that day who were um, uh, peeling off early and we're going to go on a shorter ride. So I, you know, nearly took that way out and I didn't. Um, I decided, no, it's good for me to, I was feeling really good. It was a beautiful morning. It wasn't too humid despite being early March in Brisbane. So it was absolutely perfect morning. And I just thought, no, I, you know, I'll do the full ride. Um, I want to push myself to do that. I'll sleep better on the plane. And um, yeah, then just uh, bike hit a bit of a divot in the road really um, and understeered through a corner and I had to make some control crash decisions. So mm. again, you know, yeah, lots of, you know, ifs in that but you know, mm -hmm. you know it, it really doesn't matter and the bottom line is um you know just really fortunate the way uh, things panned out yeah definitely well fast forward to now but you went through hell and back basically through you know the process obviously through the accident what were those thoughts in your head when you were having the accident were you aware consciously yeah yeah i mean i guess the you know, it's incredible i think how much you retain in those moments. I mean, for me, obviously it depends if you lose consciousness. For me, I didn't. So when you don't, you know, you really remember everything almost in slow-mo. Like wow. I remember, you know, coming down the hill at 40 k an hour or whatever it was and, and um, you know, breaking into the corner and thinking I've broken a bit, you know, I've actually braked a bit hard. I could just um, accelerate out of the corner a little bit. And so I've tried to do that just at the time I've hit that lump in the road. Next thing you know, the wheel, the front wheel just feels really weird in my hands, like the, because the, I can't, I'm no longer getting grip through the tire. So just this really weird feeling coming through my front hands and I'm thinking, I oh, know this is no good. What are my options? I'm looking, it's trying to scan the curb ahead. And I decided that I didn't have enough room anymore to effectively force the corner. Um, and, and the bit of the, because you sort of, I'm leaning into the right and leaning into the curve um, a little bit. My line of view was more to that side. And I'm looking at this curb and thinking that's, you know, that's really big, steep curb. That's no good. So if I don't want to, I'm going over the handlebars at that, but I really don't want to be crashing into that uncontrolled. So um, letting the bike keep going straight and crashing into this park I could see straight ahead was my better option knowing I'd go over the handlebars at either the curb or the pine bollards I could see so yeah that was all yeah it was pretty scary I guess making all those decisions basically you know, yeah, you to, know, I will swear seconds. you're basically going oh shit I've got no <laughs> options or, or worse and um, yeah. and yeah it was really awful I was yeah, in, in split seconds not even that and then you know and then that you know knowing that I'd go over the handlebars and then feeling the impact as the bike went up over the curb but um, I didn't go over the handlebars there but as I slammed into the pine bollards and just being you know ripped out of your are the cleats where your feet are locked into on a road bike and uh, have your hands ripped off the handlebars and super hum uh, super manning my way through the air apparently so wow. um, so one of the other riders described it very helpfully um and unfortunately then i found this this stormwater drain that was you know 1.6 1.7 meters below ground level and um so yeah, just by chance, I happened to pile drive my way straight into that, um, and uh, left hand probably clipped the ground first near the bottom of the drain. I don't think all the way down the drain. I think there was a piece of loose bluestone rock that's you know maybe a foot and a half away from the actual wall that lines the front of the drain, and I probably hit. I believe that that sort of that thing was bedded into the wall of the drain. I've sort of hit that with my hand first and then my helmet and shoulder went into it and that force um, yeah, went straight through my spine and and if you put your hand on your 
on your tummy, I guess, around your bottom of your rib cage, and you have to run that round to the middle of your back. That's the part of my back that basically got crushed by the force, and uh, two vertebrae there, um, you know, were shattered really. Um, or one was crushed a little bit, and the other one was crushed to 40% of its original height, and a big piece went for a little wander into the spinal cord. So. I didn't know any of that at that point in time. I just knew that I couldn't really breathe and pain was off the scale. Unfortunately, I'd sort of landed in a safety position. I had two physios and a nurse with me. So, if you, you know, unlike, as I keep saying, like, unlucky but lucky. If you're yeah. an un unlucky situation, uh, you know, like that, you know, having a helmet that worked was, uh, I guess, A, you know, lucky because I'd bought it. But, you know, you can, that's something that is largely in control if you cycle out there, wear a new helmet upgraded every 18 months, two years or something. Well, that's a story um, as well because you went out and bought that not too long before your accident yeah exactly it was basically just uh, half price in the christmas sale and i go yep my current helmet's sort of making my head itchy a bit and it just doesn't feel like it breathes that well i'm, I'm not loving those current helmet and um that feels lighter and just felt really nice on and yeah just went for it really just more about discomfort of my current helmet than thinking about safety and i'm so grateful i made that decision and actually i never shared this story before but trek um who made that helmet uh, under their bondrager um, brand you know they're such a good company that despite it working brilliantly and you know saving my life probably um they take it back and they want to inspect it and work out what went right in that accident and what went wrong so they can improve their technology for the future and that's why you know i guess that's sort of a no, I'm, I don't get any bond treasure endorsements. In fact, my wife and daughter in particular, my whole family don't want me to ever ride again. So, um, yeah, that's completely independent. But just I think that's a pretty special thing from a company if they're, yeah. you know, even when something is, you know, in my view, worked perfectly in the circumstance, they're still taking it back and saying, how do we learn? How do we make sure we save more yeah, people in the future? That's awesome. So, have you been back on a bike? Yeah, I'd, about. Um, 10 months after probably our youngest boy wanted to do some biking in preparation for a school camp so we just got on the the bike paths and and did some little um, little short rides on the on the mountain bikes on the bike paths for a while and that was really nice because it riding felt less abnormal than walking still does today right. um, so I was down on power and stuff but yeah just didn't seem to impact my breathing and my core muscles in the same way as as talking or sitting or standing or walking does so it was quite it was nice to get in get back out there but the, the very start yeah the first few months all i wanted to do was get back on the bike with the boys prove i could come back to that sort of superhuman sort of yeah. you know false idea if you like um i want really want to get out there but over time it became yeah less of a priority yeah obviously recovering mm. so when did you when was it that you first really understood after your accident that oh this is bad <laughs> Well, I mean, varying degrees. Clearly, when I was in the ditch, the pain was just off the scale, and I can't remember if I couldn't move or just didn't want to move because the pain was so bad. So I was nervous, and I was nervous about the, I guess, how you know, impacted my breathing was, and I was trying really hard to calm that down. So, you know, I guess at that point, I felt it was likely to be, you know, significant injuries of some description internally. But I don't know why, but I never ex never thought it was spine. Maybe it's because the you know either the boys or the paramedics had taken my shoes off at some point and, and asked me to wiggle my toes, and I could wiggle toes. I think um, apparently I said something about pins and needles in my legs, but I really don't remember that. Having said that at the time, and I, I think I just associated that with having been lying on my side in the you know ditch for a while, and it was yeah. a bit, you know a big shock to my overall system. Um, so yeah, it was literally get to hospital, see Lucy, who's rushed to meet me there go through a whole pile of scans it just felt like it was a blur of scans for a while and then about three hours after the accident or four hours after the accident about three hours after i presented in hospital um is when they started going through the results of my scans and i guess that's the point in time i really knew it was serious and yeah i was completely shattered you know lost for quite a while in terms of digesting that information and working my way through it and you know can i actually tackle this you know am i packing up and going home or am i going to find a way to um pick myself up and move forward yeah well speaking of that i mean obviously physically you were trashed literally but mentally you weren't because yeah. of where you are now i mean it's on the edge right so i don't think anyone could well i i have heard some people speak and and seem to cope even better than than i did out of situations like this but um yeah it was really up and down I and mean, particularly the you know the periods of time in hospital 
Um, but at the very start, the first day, you know, I, I really can't remember thinking much at all for a few hours after the uh, that news. Um, I know I, you know, probably did doze in and out because obviously I was starting to get pretty intense pain relief. I was, um, you know, probably pretty um, exhausted from the way my body had to, I guess, effectively shut down and protect the areas of the body that were the hurt. Um, but, you know, for periods there, I just think, yeah, I was really lost mentally and, and I just, I guess, managed to pick my way out of that by imagining people that had been through tougher things and, and mm -hmm. come out the other side and what sort of attitudes might they have employed. You know, obviously, I thought about Lucy and her own journey and some other friends that have been through pretty intense journeys and, you know, if they can keep finding hope and just turn up um, as thoroughly as they did through all of that, then... Then I should be able to at least, you know, uh, emulate that to a degree. Um, so you know, suck it up and and have a crack. I think was pretty much where my mind got to. And then you sort of form that mindset. And then as you know, sort of talk about in the book, you know, then that night I I wasn't really perturbed by having to go through a five hour operation. But then you know you wake up post that and realise just how immobile it was and how you'd sort of generated this resolve yesterday and it seems completely distant and worthless because of course you know in that first day when you're trying to find hope and resolve to what you understand to be a really difficult position you still don't quite understand how bad it is mm, um you yeah. know until you get out of that operation and have to try and move and and i realized i literally couldn't push myself you know uh, an inch up the bed um from a movement perspective and i was just so sore and there were so many shock waves of pain and it was just all really tough so definitely yeah, I'm proud of my mindset overall, I think, in dealing with it. But it was very, I won't say it was, you know, perfect. It was very up and down. I had to keep managing it. And then at times when I probably was on the border of not managing it, had what I call gentle interventions and help from others that probably mm. helped me just, you know, find a spark of hope when I needed it, find a spark of my own identity when I needed it. Because I think that can be really powerful at rekindling your hope as well. And um, I call them sort of embers, the embers of yourself, the embers of, you know, your identity and what you yeah. stand for and your values and how do you, you know, I guess blow on them and or have someone blow on them and just get them rekindled and sparked up and, and use that as a way, you know, to help you light your way forward as well. So, yeah, I definitely got help. Mm, well, I did want to talk to you a little bit more about embers. The way that you describe them, it, you can really visualise the embers in a fire. That's what I thought, like, that's just... That's G, <laughs> G for genius, how you came to, yeah, oh. tell me a little bit more about that. Well, when I first started thinking about speaking about my journey and, you know, I guess there was this balance of speaking and writing and so I was brainstorming, I guess, what I felt had helped me and so I really felt the illumination of, help, of hope, the illumination of hope was so important to me and so that was sort of one of the areas I was focusing on as being an area I was going to drill at. And it, within that, I'd sort of had this idea of the hope that's on the hill in the sky so far away, so distance that you're aspiring to and that being really important and really helping me. But I felt like there was more than that. There was this element of, I guess, um, you know, curiosity and being able to challenge and explore things because that finds new possibility and new ways to hope mm. but also that idea of there was more more again there was something from effectively the pathway of life um from within you these this sense of who you are the identity um i guess all your great memories the connections you have and how you're in a much more positive way of driving yourself forward if you can both see the light on the hill and that light, that sense of light from inside yourself and almost coming up out of the ground and, and leading you the way forward, you know, not necessarily the perfect way to that same aspiring light on the hill, but, but enough just for the next few steps, the next few steps, the next few steps. And if you can find that light both from the sky and from this sort of, I guess, from the ground, from the innateness inside you, um, then you're more capable of persevering. And, and I guess I felt like I'd been in a position where I needed needed pretty hard to persevere um it was you know fundamental and it was hard and and somehow i found it so i guess i was trying to 
you know attribute what had helped me and and sort of came up with that concept and and yeah over time thanks to birds of tokyo uh, illumination morphed into lanterns which i think is a better uh, metaphor for it um, but you know it's that overall idea of illumination from within and and i guess somehow embers you know as that sort of when the spark of you is almost out because of the news you've received but you find a way to bring it back to life uh, embers just seem like the perfect way to represent yeah. that there were yeah when you were talking about embers i had tears going down my face because you know um i firstly i've got no absolutely no doubt that a fraction stronger is going to help anyone who's been through a major upheaval a catastrophe if you like by giving hope and grit to finding their path to keep going but it's even more than that it shows like the stamina and strength that everyone can have you know even people that haven't been through that um that they can have in their lives to reach better destinations better goals to be a better person a better vision of themselves um so what was your actual intention writing the book because i think you know broadly speaking it's going to help <laughs> everybody not just somebody who's been through someone something yeah. like you but it, I, I learned so much from hearing it thank you i can give such long answers to this <laughs> question really um it's definitely helped people in hardship and i really treasure that you know that, that it's having that impact and it's helping people that just want to change and i think um, at a very high level that was central to what i hoped for in the book and it's only ever hope when you're writing a book like you know it may come to nothing much at all um but i, I definitely wanted people to both realize that they were probably a fraction stronger already in their life from what they'd gone through what they'd experienced what they knew because often we are very good at applauding you know these big ticket items like courage and resilience and grit in others i sometimes say we put it up on a pedestal we sort of extend what it is in our own eyes mm. and then be little our own um, achievements towards those things uh, as an internal process as well so definitely sort of wanted people to appreciate that they were stronger than they realized because of what they've been through before and and, and i want people to as they read the book sorry i want that sounds awfully strong i hope that as people um, read the book that they get a bit of that that reflection that self-reflection of all the great things they've been through and of course um you know as i did um, you know being able to understand other people have been through tough journeys and and borrow a little bit of their belief and their inspiration can also make you a fraction stronger if you need to in the future so you know there's definitely that that hope that that it both you know helps you currently and also might just be something you remember in the future and go yeah uh, that's going to help me and i'll tackle it you know using a bit of that you know at least some of those uh, thought processes so it's definitely all of those things mm. then just extending on quickly because i did promise to be a long answer sorry listeners um you've got I guess we're loving it don't be sorry very, very start <laughs> you start the process and you know i guess it's sort of who would read it you know is it really that that much of a story and so you know probably started thinking a very cheap and cheerful book that maybe i'd drop to pa hospital and royal brisbane hospital in particular that was so um, influential to me and maybe they'll get into a few hands that need it and it'll just change a few lives positively and that's you know that would be amazing and at least i feel like i'm paying back for all the help i got so that was probably the very start of it and then you know my overall personality took over and you know you know i you know i'm working with a book coach to get some structure and then I'm, um yeah it was fortunate enough that that draft was good enough to get picked up by um, a lovely publisher down in melbourne called major street and you know they bluntly said look there's something in your story but the book's not quite good enough yet bits of it are good enough but um, you know you're going to need to put as much work in again um, if you you know want it to want us to work with you and we think it's worthwhile us working together are you interested and to me that was just really positive feedback it's like anything like you know, it basically says you're making progress there's you know it's worth it makes sense to persevere so after what you've just been through you knew how to persevere <laughs> yeah correct <laughs> correct and um I'd probably, you know, I'd just done my first few keynote speeches and, and even though I was pretty raw at doing those in, in May 2021, uh, you know, at least it gave me some idea that this that the story might help people. Um, I'd had someone drive up to from the Gold Coast uh, with their son for one of those speeches and then reach out to me to be on a talkback 
you know, online program and stuff. So it felt like it had some more merit than perhaps I realized. So, you know, I guess both that and just the whole incoming premise of I was helped, how do I help other people, mm. encouraged me to, you know, invest and persevere some more. And, and that led to me working with Brooke Lyons, my editor, who, um, you know, really helped me be vulnerable and, um, you know, show more of the journey um, more deeply through the book, which I think ultimately will mean it does actually help more people yeah. as uncomfortable as that was for me. And I, I, one of the questions I really love and I get quite consistently is, well, you know, how do you encourage uh, other, um, you know, particular, I guess, older males to open up about their feelings given you were able to do it in the book? And I don't really know the answer. All I know is that for me, it was a, it was a trade-off. I just basically go, well, it's uncomfortable, but I feel like it's more likely to reach its purpose and help people if I do it. So yeah. I, I persuaded myself effectively to um, to keep opening up and, and making sure it was a, you know, um, people could really connect with the story and, and feel feel the journey with me. And, um, you know, the bits of the book that are about me, and obviously I don't want, didn't want all of the book to be about me and it isn't, but the bits yeah. that are about me are, um, you know, I think people will often feel like they're in the bed with me, they're, on the bike with me there 100 trying to walk with me and uh, you know we really tried to take them there so they could feel it yeah i can i definitely got that sense particularly i can't remember which chapter it was now but when you were in the bed probably after your operation and you were trying to inch yourself up the bed that just <laughs> that's what reminded me of that question basically the the lack of physical strength that you had and the mental power that you had to just get yourself up fraction by fraction is you know is that how the title of the book came from that bed scene yeah so as i wrote the um as i wrote the book its working title was always it's it's not about the fall the idea being um that, that it's not about how we fall over it's how we choose to get up and as a cyclist it was a bit of a spin on lance armstrong's um bike a book it's not about the bike so that was where i started mentally and my book coach didn't like that title and um and so she sort of encouraged me to 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 rethink on titles and and actually i, I really just sort of came back to how do i want people to feel i want them to feel stronger yeah. um so so titles that sort of centered around stronger um became sort of my focus area and yeah i guess we just sort of really challenged that and said well if you really want them to appreciate their strength um all we needed them to do is appreciate that fraction that they need to get through the moment i guess that's pretty similar to the way i i paint courage in the book as well you know um again courage doesn't need to be on a pedestal it needs to be whatever we need it to be to get us through the moment we're in yeah. to get to the better moments ahead and and strength is the same so just a fraction might be enough you know to get you to the next bit and or to you know find a fraction of strength to believe you've got a fraction more strength than you have and um yeah certainly come back to lying in the bed not being able to move an inch and you know there was times where I could have just mentally quit and you just go and, and maybe i did for you know m minutes at different stages no doubt but um you know eventually you go well it's pretty horrid being where i am um it's only fractionally more horrid to push myself to move that little bit um but if i push myself to move that little bit I'm progressing or I'm avoiding a setback. And if I can do those things, then maybe tomorrow will be a better day. Maybe tomorrow I'll be able to drive myself forward um, a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And yeah, just that whole idea of, which was very consistent, Claire's story, uh, other you know, stories that I that I knew of, that I you know, learnt, learnt more of after I started writing the book, that um, willpower just to find a way to persevere in today's moment, defer your desire to quit to the future in some way if you really you know feel like you're going to quit we'll find a way to defer that tomorrow because circumstances might change a little bit by what have you achieved today mm. and um and if you can just keep kicking that can down the road and keep progressing next thing you know you're in a slightly better position yeah well you've certainly come such a long way so obviously your mental power has been outstanding all the way through and some of the other stories that you share in the book obviously they had been i say it very loosely when i say that they may have gone through harder situations than what you thought that you went through oh no doubt but yeah they or very inspirational just obviously your main inspirations to make you feel stronger like they can do it i can do this yeah you know and you know different and i had to tap into those feelings at different mm. 
depths at different stages. So at times it was just a knowledge there in your back of your head that, you know, other people have gone through tougher and other times when you're closer to quitting, it was really challenging yourself and going, well, they found a way. Yeah. What might they have done? How might they have found a, you know, what might they have done in this situation or what do I know of their how they got through it um, or how do I just know they got through it to mean that they must have got through situations like this because if they're in a tougher position than me and they got through it, they must have found a way There's to a way. get to even tougher moments than this and if they can do it, then surely I can find a way. Mm. You mentioned in your book Angels a lot and obviously you had some incredible moments when people would rock up right at the right moment for you. In particular, I think it was one of your children's um, teacher's wives who came in and you were not in the mood for any company. <laughs> I don't think I was in the mood for any company most of the first week. You know, you just feel so shattered and defeated and, broken. you know, broken, sorry for myself a lot, penalizing myself for, you know, acts that I couldn't control. That it wasn't, you know, wasn't a fault. I wasn't really doing anything wrong. I just got you know unlucky the way the bike hit the wall the the spot in the road um so yeah all of those things you need know, sort of feeling like just leave me alone world at this point and i'll find a way to battle this out in isolation and yeah i guess perhaps just pause for a minute and think about those times when you know maybe you've been more mentally fragile yourself and how you do want to go into isolation but how it actually generally isn't the right strategy and i was so lucky that people um, you know, came in at the right moment and you know, the, the D situation was just, yeah, you just sort of, I don't even know if I woke up, which was you know quite regular at that point in time, you're just dozing off, you know, regularly um, in the yeah. first day or two and she pops in and she's got flowers and chocolate or something and I don't recognize you and, uh, and she, I, I presume she was in hospital scrubs. I really can't remember, that, but I presume she was, um, you know, maybe she wasn't um, plastic surgeon and yeah, her husband was my eldest boy's year five school teacher just in a freak of timing he'd been cycling the same route the day before had stopped to because he recognized some of the other parents from school checked out the situation by the end of the day you know knowing it was serious or you know whether, whether it was the end of the day or you know as soon as he's got back from the ride he started contacting the senior staff of the school and saying you know look out look out for the the, the buried children the Berridge boys the next couple of days at school because this does look serious. Obviously he told the story to his wife and she's a plastic surgeon and obviously works, was working at the hospital I was at. So she's decided she's, I guess she probably initially just decided she was going to come find me in the hospital and provide moral support. Um, and as fate would have it, I had a couple of wounds she actually needed to tend. So she was the, you know, once I guess she saw that on file that I was going to need stitches on a couple of fingers um, and there were stitches that needed an incredible amount of skill and precision that she was going to be the one that did them. So I, overall an, an amazingly emotional moment and emotional now you may be able to hear someone can see it. She's, yeah. she's nodding at me with support like an angel would. Yeah. But, um, you know, just all of that stuff where, um, you know, just come in and and it makes again come back to building embers it's the stuff that goes life is worth living like i might be feeling like i don't want to see anyone and i want to quit this life at this point in time or i don't, I don't think i really had those thoughts of quitting life if you like but just at quitting quitting qu quitting driving myself forward quitting you know, giving it my best shot, which had been my resolve on the first day before I realized quite how hard giving it my best shot was going to be. You know, just this is hard, right? This this realization of how hard it was and just people like that reminding you of how good the world we live in is and how good people are uh, and giving you memories to rekindle and, and persevere, you know, cause you to persevere and find that grit when you need that next. Because of course, every one of these kind of moments when someone comes in and does something really kind, it's amazing in the moment, but it also reminds you tomorrow when you need to find a way to persevere tomorrow yeah. because hang on, this amazing person has been so kind and come in and done this and that might happen. You know, I don't know whether you sort of necessarily fully mentally collect it to connect it to this might happen again but i think in some intuitive way you do you don't want to sort of count count your chickens sort of it does yeah. so i don't think you take it all the way through to the it might happen again but you sort of realize that it happens yeah and you're more in tune with it happening and yeah all those powerful things so yeah they're all to me they're all part of that overall angel idea and to me angels you know a lot of external help but it's also that 
you know, well, there are some things you can tr control. You can control your own effort. There are some angels you can sort of um, tap into yourself, even if those other angels aren't coming. Mm. Incredible stories, and that's not the only one with the search. And there's other people that you had no clue about, really, that rock up into your life, and they're there giving you support and helping you move fra a fraction more to your goal. I had moments listening to you narrate, completely disassociating you with the person that had to deal with everything that you went through. So, yeah, because I guess for me, it's hard to fathom that you came from somebody completely broken to now being here narrating your book. Was it your mental power? Was it the angels? Was it the embers? What can you pinpoint what that was? Yeah, well, just, you know, when you're ro recording an audio book, there's no 100 meter sprint involved because if we had to run 100 meters up the road, then Simone would probably beat me by 50 meters. So she's not setting world records there and she's going to beat me by a long way. So, look, you know, getting off the ground's hard, you know, walking's hard, moving fast. I'm, you know, I, I don't want to put myself in a position where I'm, um, having an accidental meeting with a bus, right? I'm not going to be getting out of the way real quick. So, you know, how I look to the average person is not quite how it's going on inside from an effort perspective. But, you know, that's a, I guess that physical side is very separate to the overall mindset journey of the, of the book. And I do very much feel like the, I guess the metaphors, the, the, the pillars I have in the book of, you know, those lanterns. So finding your, your, your hope, whether it be inside you, like your embers or externals, uh, the angels, again, whether that's internal and the effort and the things you can control or the external shepherds that find a way to um, intervene or to help or just be generous and kind um, and managing the demons. So not letting those bad moments completely overwhelm me and uh, finding strategies, which in my case was generally just taking action. That was probably pretty much my you know, main go-to, there's a few others, but, you know, all of those things to get collectively definitely um, both help drive me forward in terms of a physical recovery, but also help me, you know, deal with what is the longer probably process of the mental recovery. And, you know, I guess the the book finishes with a couple of chapters that are, you know, one's finding worth, which we put in the demons chapter, um, because for me, that comeback, you know, where I thought I would find salvation for want of a better word um out of physical recovery and and reconnect with all of my you know prior life better um you know i just found that i guess hard and then and then the day like it was i was falling short of it despite all my best efforts so then we you know i guess we had to find other ways to to keep grinding myself forward from a you know finding more uh, meaning in not meaning life but um you know, finding my next evolution that was going to come out of, you know, being not the same physical person as before because I'm not the physical same physical person before. I can't be the overall package that I was before and, and therefore, you know, how all these new bits of me come together to, you know, be something valuable and, and come back to that idea of embers and other things, you know. It's worth being valuable. We are all valuable, right? Exactly. And that's what life's about is those, um, you know, getting, finding opportunities, getting things done, creating meaning, having your friendships, your connections, your memories, doing something tough, getting through it, you know, forges the best relationships and the, the best sense of self. So all of those things are worth persevering for. So yeah, so they ended up with these couple of chapters, you know, finding worth and then now Fraction Stronger, which is really trying to say that it's an ongoing um, challenge to, you know, keep finding my meaning and who I am. And the, the, you know, the book's obviously a central part of that at the moment. And, you know, so that has its, Pluses and minuses as well, of course, because you you end up almost hinging more of your personal value to you know how the book's sales are going. Not that that was ever written for, for you know for that purpose, but you sort of start to appreciate just how great the book can be in the right hands from a you know meeting its purpose perspective and people that are you know whether they are in hardship or just wanting to make hard change, um, and you sort of go, yeah, if I could just keep grinding away at. Um, at book promotion in the, the same way as I did at rehab, then maybe I'll, I'll crack through on that one too. And, and and just to wrap this up, you know, perhaps that's exactly the essence of life is that, you know, it is like that. We grind away at things and sometimes it comes off in the way we expected it to when we expected it to, but not that often. Most of the time it comes off in different ways in mm. different time frames, and we never quite know. So 
um, we just keep investing, keep investing, keep investing, and uh, and eventually, you know, a we get the reward um, that we uh, in in ways we didn't expect, and that's even more wonderful. Um, and b we can look back and go, yeah, well, yeah, well, look at this, you know fractions of things that were happening and I didn't realize these fractions of things were happening until they sort of came to be this new thing that I didn't even know was going to happen yeah. so who knows where things lead well it's it's funny that you should say that maybe you know your destiny or your purpose on the planet here was to actually have that accident so you could write this book yeah, I'm certainly not going to replicate that so I can write a second book. We'll have to come up with a different <laughs> way to, to crack through for that. Um, you know, and I guess so then you get this beautiful situation. Like I used to write poetry a lot in as a teenager, early adult, um, and that really got put to the side for a long time. And you know, I always had that sort of creative element I was never really fully utilising. So um, yeah, now I can, I guess, reconnect with that stuff. So. I can both be this new, um, you know, author that's, um, you know, as a, I like to joke, an accidental author or <laughs> catapulted, catapulted back into <laughs> contact with my creative side. I, I can get those jokes, which actually still connect with my embers because my part of my embers is being playful and that sense of fun and, and having horrible dad jokes that my children hate. So <laughs> I've, I've managed to be both a new person and connect with my old person by coming up with humour like accidental author. So Yeah, that's very cool. <laughs> Yeah, you cracked me up when you said, in regards to my other question, you know, like, you look like you're doing okay now from where you came. And he, Mark says to me, well, do you want to watch me get off the floor? <laughs> I always say, don't get down there to get back up. Please. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, it's not that bad. It just, I've got certain ways I have to get off the floor and, it, you know, probably take me 10 or 15 seconds to recover. I mean, you know, we... Um, Lucy and I don't entertain as much as we did pre-injury because it's just harder. And um, but we did on Saturday night, and you know, just carrying a bottle of one bottle of wine up the stairs, and you know, just even that, you just realise how much physically I'm impacted. Like it doesn't take very much of a load to really remind myself that just how I guess impacted my overall leg strength is. Um, but at the same time, you just, you know, like I do with so many other situations, the mantra kicks in of, yeah. well, you may not enjoy, um, you know, how you, in, your breathing and your, your strength is impacted, but at least you're walking with the hope of improvement. And, you know, whilst it's more uncomfortable um, than normal, well, that means that I'm probably getting some leg strength and some, you know, maybe a fraction of improvement out of walking up the stairs with that you know one bottle of wine of load um is actually driving me forward whilst i don't like the moment the the process of doing it is probably actually moving me in the right way so you know i guess that's that's just life isn't it so i just you know i am where i am and um i just keep um finding you know all those life opportunities to keep trying to imp secure a bit more of improvement um because you know i i don't think i'll ever fully disconnect my physical capability to my sense of identity even if my sense of identity is shifting in you yeah. know, new ways it's growing it's growing probably substantially more than the normal person that doesn't have to go through something like that but um you've got a really good grip on yourself though you know to me you seem very grounded and obviously your humor you've obviously got a lot of support from your family who cherish and love you that have you know helped you get stronger no doubt and you know family network community you know um the privilege of the community we're in and even just like little things and you know lots of people would be in the same situation of you know trying to navigate which hospital next and just the amount of um i guess good quality advice we were able to tap into you know either directly from our friendship circle or them reaching out to you know other physios or other specialists that might be able to guide where next to from a hospital perspective and um you know because one of the advantages of um hope is you know you might underestimate how hard something is in the future and you sort of need that in a way because it helps you believe that you can get there therefore having people that might help you make sure that uh, there isn't a long-term consequence out of you being you know too hopeful and um therefore not getting the help you need whether that be the you know physiotherapy help in my case or some other help if you don't have people just sort of you know steering and guiding and um, allowing you to have some hope of yeah i might recover quicker than i expected but also guarding against the the alternative by giving you the good advice of where else to go and how to prepare um then i guess that's the best of both worlds in a lot of ways of you know how do you have that that balance and and i think our yeah our community and friends and family were really good at helping me 
um, with that balance, you know, lots of good examples. Mm. So your journey with uh, A Fraction Stronger now, you're doing public speaking. You have done a few spots and helping people directly, I guess, by speaking to them live. Where do you see yourself, say, with the book in the next five years? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't think I ever went through a process of going, oh, you know, I'm going to be a TED talker or something. And, and you look at some of those and they're just so um, so awesome. And I, I guess you know, maybe the book in total, maybe speaking is very similar. Um, I like to, to run the parallel to cooking. Like I used to love cooking and I was, I think I was a pretty talented cook. I did some you know, amazing meals and people would go, wow, that was amazing food. So glad we did that. And I'd put a lot of effort into it, like you know, what I'd call three phase cooking. So, you know, like because um, the Echo restaurant here in Brisbane, Philip Johnson, he had a lot of stuff which was three phase where you, you know, do one level of preparation and then it's got to go through another level of preparation and another level of preparation before you get this amazing meal a day or later. So I do a lot of that sort of stuff. Anyway, and people will say, oh, you're so good. And they're going, do you, are they, you should be a MasterChef. And I'm going, have you got any idea actually how good people a MasterChef <laughs> are? So maybe in terms of my speaking versus, the, I guess, the very high level people, maybe I'm, you know, there's a big gap in, um, in reality. But, you know, like anything, the best way to, to deal with that gap, to narrow it, is just to keep practicing, get out there and connect with people. And ultimately, that's why I do it, so that I can share my story with the hope that, it makes a positive impact on someone else's life in the same way that, you know, when Carney Little spoke in at an event that I went to in 2010, I was able to remember that. I couldn't remember her name, but I could remember her enough of her story and, and certainly a photo that came to mind um, when I needed it uh, of her as a you know, toddler um, and thinking, well, if you can go on from that to be a you know, Paralympic athlete, multiple medals um, and do so much else to inspire people, then... Um, you know, I wasn't aspiring to be that at the moment. I was trying to find hope, but I was just going, if you can do that sort of stuff, then then I can find a way to get through this moment to get to better moments tomorrow, and and just keep grinding myself forward. And so, if my book, my book, or my speaking has um, you know a fraction of that impact, that's still an amazing, amazing thing. Mm. Well, a fraction stronger. It's relatable to all walks of life because ultimately, though, I guess that what that's what life's journey is. It is just fraction by fraction, isn't it, to get to where your destination is on a path. And I guess you're living proof that if that path changes, you go fraction by fraction to wherever that path then takes you. I think that's such a good way of looking at it because, you know, if it's just these little fractions that are compounding on, compounding and compounding on each other to build something special, well, they don't need to be a perfectly straight line. No. They can, they can, and life does duck and weave a bit, and yes, you know, twists and turns does. we don't expect on us. And um, so they're little fractions. You know, it's maybe it's like a crystal. Crystal would be pretty boring if it was just all a straight oh, line, right? Oh, you know, it's if it's beautiful. sitting on, um, you know, sitting lots of little different structures and all of that stuff that makes up the fabric of us and the fabric of our life has, you know, it. Yeah, I, I sometimes when I talk, is the line that it. You know, it's within those twists and turns that we find our sort of, you know, our sense of meaning, our purpose mm. and, uh, you know, who we are. And, and I think, yeah, that all those little fractions are, are what make us up, what make up the beauty of our life, our uniqueness. You know, we are all unique. Sometimes uh, lots of social media and other things try and take that unique uniqueness away from us. But actually all those little, you know, adventures and misadventures that we've had are part of who we are. And all of those little fractions, you know, uh, able to be tapped into when we need it to drive ourselves forward and, and who knows where the next fractions you know which directions mm, they'll take us so it's so amazing so profound yeah thank you thank you mark for coming in and recording your audio book with me i highly recommend it like you know if you want to be a fraction stronger this is the book to read where can people contact you where can people find your book your audio book hopefully will be out within the next six weeks. Uh, no, let's just start there. I'm super excited. <laughs> I've done the audio book. It, you know, um, you know, it does feel when you you I guess go through a book process. There's just you lot putting a lot of energy in a lot of different ways, and and I nearly didn't do the audio book, but it just felt the right thing to do from a purpose, and I couldn't have been happier with the process of recording it here um, with someone. It was amazing. So. Super excited when that gets out there and I can share that the world. Um, I have to say, you know, listening to me for eight hours may not be your thing. I get that. Other, if it isn't, then find a fraction stronger in the bookstore. Um, it's uh, uh, probably in most bookstores, Dimmicks and um, yeah, in around Brisbane, but you know, around Australia, Booktopia, Amazon, or on my website, markberridge.com. 
www.ethanpatrick.com.au and you can contact me there for about speaking gigs or uh, just you know other ways to catch up or I might be able to you know put you in contact with someone form a connection that might help you in your moment of need which ultimately is the journey I'm on now because so many people did that for me Mm, wonderful yeah you're an amazing man um did you mention that you're actually doing a walk soon for prostate prostate cancer i'm walking at the moment for prostate cancer i guess that sort of stemmed from last well a few different things the ceo of uh, prostate cancer foundation australia was the ceo of bike queensland the point in time i fell off my bike and she was just amazing that point in time so you know what comes around goes around i, I guess i wanted to support that foundation the last couple of years um, I did it last year to just to raise some money um, and get myself moving because at that point in time I sort of probably was needed to to get out and walk for various reasons. I had an aspirational goal around walking that I needed to get break inertia on, and sometimes you need an, ex well, an excuse. <laughs> it, yeah, I'd say. I mean, it always comes to me. I believe it always comes inter internally, but you sort of get yourself over that internal threshold of motivation. Mm. Sometimes using an external trigger, mm. and so for me, yeah, the last two Septembers has been you know, walking seventy two kilometres for um, fundraising for Prostate Cancer Foundation Australia. This year, I'm doing it. My cousin's doing it on, uh, with me, and he is absolutely smashing me from a kilometres perspective so go go cuz Johnny great work uh, I will not catch him remotely from a kilometers perspective uh, to get to my 72 but that's my intention for the month and just raise a bit of money while I'm doing it but more than anything raise awareness I mean you know just yeah. even getting dropped a note by um, you know an old friend who obviously is going through a pretty tough prostate um, you know cancer battle at the moment and um, I, you know which I wouldn't have realized but for um, you know putting it out that I'm doing it again and and so you know in some ways that provides you know a deeper connection for us but also might provide a bit of help for him at a, at a moment but also provides you know more impetus for me for being open about everything that happened to me in, in terms of my journey because you never know who's going to help and when yeah that's right okay so a fraction stronger out at all good books stores the audio books on its way hopefully up soon and mark berridge thank you so much for being a part of my podcast today total pleasure thank you Thanks for joining the Simon Filer podcast. What's your story? Contact Simon for a chat at brisbaneaudiobookproduction.com.